And without much further ado, I'm presenting Oliver Knapp from Nokia, and he'll be talking about uh, Bitstream Layer 2 Bitstream Access. Thank you. Thank you. So, hello everyone. Late in the afternoon, already dark outside. I hope you don't fall asleep yet. Uh, my name is Oliver Knapp. I work for Nokia now in consulting engineering for our IP products. What I want to tell you about today is Layer 2 Bitstream Access. Um, there was quite of a discussion in the German tech media recently on VDSL vectoring and upcoming plans of Deutsche Telekom and uh, a word about remonopolization was flying around and so on. So not all people were happy about it, as from what I could read. So I thought let's shed a little light onto this, what this means and uh, what it does mean for you as operators. Which brings us to the agenda. Sorry for one thing, by the way. I, I had sent the, the program committee a note that I would prefer to have this talk in German because it's actually only relevant for the German market and only relevant for customers of Deutsche Telekom. So for everybody coming from outside of Germany, this is going to be irrelevant anyway. Um, so apologies, my slides are in German now, but I can do the talk in English. So the first thing is, well, Nokia, um, probably most of you haven't heard much about Nokia and IP products, so I want to uh, explain a bit about that. The second thing is the market, uh, what is happening in that market at the moment and why is it happening. Uh, the third topic is then, what does Deutsche Telekom offer as a wholesale offering to you as city operators or whatever, uh, people who had access di uh, directly to the copper tile before. Then we have uh, what possible implementations if you want to purchase that wholesale offering from Deutsche Telekom, so if you want to use VDSL lines provided by Deutsche Telekom. And the, the last one is mostly interesting for city operators who have owned fiber networks in the city and who might roll out vectoring on their end so that probably they would even be suppliers to Deutsche Telekom later on. So let's start with the first one, Nokia. Who, you know what, is Nokia? Um, it's quite easy. Um, actually, Alcatel Lucent, we, uh, last year when we were here, we were still Alcatel Lucent. We've been acquired since then in the meantime. Um, it was not a merger, simply Nokia really bought us, with including everything. So, well, I'll leave the marketing out. The, uh, the main thing is what you know from Alcatel Lucent in optical and IP routing products is now simply Nokia, that's it. It's the same people, it's the same products. Okay, I'll hold this in my hand. <laughs> And the only thing that really changed is we got new company signs, so the Alcatel signs were put off, Nokia signs were put on. The one thing, if I, if I go around and say I work for Nokia, ah, mobile phones, no, not at the moment at least. Um, what was no mobile phones from Nokia has been sold off to Microsoft, and yeah, you probably have noticed that Microsoft also doesn't want to do this anymore. <laughs> Good. So what does Nokia have to do with Layer 2 Bitstream Access? Uh, it's actually quite simple. I mean, we're a, a network equipment supplier with a really broad uh, palette of technologies. I mean, we do access, we do transport, we do IP and all that, uh, all that stuff. Um, and we are obviously supplier for quite many players in the German market. Uh, very large players and uh, also very small players. Um, the other thing is the layer two, bits, layer 2 bitstream access is something that is going to happen in the German market, so that's for sure. The German regulator has signed this off recently, so it's now in force, uh, which means our technology simply has to be compatible to that. Quite easy. And obviously we have to do, and we have to provide solutions for both people providing wholesale access to VDSL vectoring lines and also for the, others, uh, the other end of the table, for people buying wholesale access of vectoring lines. Nokia itself um, has been engaged in the so-called NGA forum for quite a long time, the Next Generation Access Forum, uh, which means we were actively participating in the whole specification of the Layer 2 Bitstream Access. Uh, the NGA forum was a forum that consisted mostly of small city operators and also Deutsche Telekom was present in there, so it was a common all-market uh, platform where people discussed how could we make this happen if it comes to far, what do we want to have as standards so that everybody has a name to target on. If the market develops that far in technology, how is this going to fly? Um, since the regulator is discussing this and it's getting more concrete, um, obviously we as Nokia get a lot of questions from customers to that subject because they now have to live with it on the one or the other variant. So we had to do a, refer a reference implementation on our end, um, which means, well, I had to get into it myself uh, quite deeply. 
So, what are we talking about here? I mean, Nokia is a pure technology supplier. We don't do any politics as far as we can avoid it. Um, we like all of our customers. Um, there is no unimportant customers for us. Um, and I want to have a clear focus here on technology and not of, on politics and not on lawyer things here because there has been a lot of lawyer things ongoing in the whole layer 2 bitstream discussion. On the other hand, um, in order to understand why this is all happening in the market and why is it is happening that way, we also have to look a bit on the market here. So that's uh, a little bit where we have to get outside of the field of technology. Um, a generic uh, principle here is, as far as possible, I want to be vendor and also carrier neutral as far as it's possible. Well, I, I've left out CLI on our notes as well, and obviously I can tell you how this could possibly work on Juniper notes. I would expect that all major vendors can handle this in a similar way. This is a Nokia view, obviously, if you want to hear how the other vendors do it, well, you need to ask them, but I'm pretty sure they will do it in a similar way. Um, the other thing is, well, whether we like it or not, Deutsche Telekom is very, very likely to be a dominant player in the market of wholesale offerings for VDSL vectoring. So whilst I wouldn't have liked to look on single offerings here, this is a regulated offering, which is public anyway. And if it's so dominant in the market, then I think we should have a look into more details, as this is very, very likely what most of the smaller operators will have to purchase in the future. The last thing we are contractually we have NDAs with our customers and we maintain some level of privacy here so I cannot give you any insider infos on how the one or the other operator does this actually in their network uh, in the special case of Deutsche Telekom I even can't do it because I don't work in the team that handles Deutsche Telekom within the Nokia company um, so all the content of this uh, presentation here is based on public information. You can all download these papers uh, from, from the German ministries, from the German regulator, whatever. So there is definitely no trade secrets in here. Layer 2 bitstream access and the market. What, what did happen here? The funny thing is our government had get good ideas. Already in 2009, wherever, they had a broadband strategy of the German federal government, which said until at latest end of 2010, we should have powerful broadband connections everywhere in Germany. And until the end of 2014, you notice this has already passed, 75% um, of the households should have access to at least 50 megabits per second. And the, the big goal is to have that available everywhere as soon as possible. So this was the broadband strategy until 2014. What came afterwards was the digital agenda, 2014 to 17. This is available from the German uh, Ministry of Industry. Um, the goal now is... Uh, <laughs> To, to get with an efficient technology mix, and there, this is where it becomes interesting, uh, uh, a, a, a full area coverage of broadband infrastructure with at minimum 50 megabits until 2018. So we've shifted it already a little. The funny thing is, um, we want to do this under a market-driven approach. Market-driven approach is another wording for the state doesn't want to pay for it. Somebody else should pay for it. That's the baseline, um, which also brings us later into the regulatory office. Why was, this, why was this done that way? It had to be commercially interesting to somebody who should build that. Um, and we also want to have digital access for rural areas. So there's always the story of the remote farm somewhere wide out there who can't have internet access for their tractors now and they can't do farming 4.0, whatever it is. So that's a goal here. And... In order to achieve this, we will, make, we will provide invest, uh, investment and innovation uh, pushing regulations, which makes everybody happy. That's the baseline here. Um, let's see whether they manage this. So that was the agenda 2014 to 17. What comes now is the digital strategy 2025. <laughs> yeah, they, they needed to find new names for these concepts over the times. Um, now it's new, new ways of selling things and logistics, Internet of Things, autonomous cars and industry 4.0. That's a lot of buzzwords in one sentence. This is what you need for what you need gigabit speeds and we need a fiber network, which is interesting because at the moment what they're building is copper networks. 
And I also don't completely get why a connected car needs fiber access, and I'm also not sure how this is technically viable. Um, on the other hand, in the next sentence they say, well, the, the, the current broadband strategy, which was focused on providing private subscribers with, with access, uh, up to 50 megabits should now extend it to have also business access and, and fiber access. They say themselves Germany doesn't have fast internet. <laughs> that's that's bird 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 in there here. Um, I've just put it here because I find the numbers quite interesting. Only 15% of the internet accesses in Germany, according to this paper, reach uh, a download a downstream rate of more than 15 megabit per second. I can say that from my own end, I live in the middle of Munich and I only have 10 megabits, but I'm happy with it actually, that's the other thing. What is funny that only for 7% of the households, there is a fiber access available today, and only 1% of them uses such a fiber access. So from all those people who could have fiber, only 15% are actually taking it and buying it. Which raises the question, at least for me, well, why are we doing all this thing if people aren't apparently that desperately waiting for it? Because if they would be desperately waiting, then that would have a take rate of 100%, which it doesn't have. Okay, but that's the, what our government has to say on this. Now, a bit on technology, VDSL vectoring. You've probably heard this already, so this is just a comparison again. Uh, the main problem with vectoring is that the gains that vectoring delivers over regular standard VDSL without vectoring can only be achieved if there is only one single DSLAM driving a whole bundle of copper access lines. Uh, I have a comparison here. I mean, on the left slide you see in red what bandwidth can you uh, achieve on a copper loop length of, uh, here's 400 meter, 1000 meter length without vectoring. That's on a short line approximately 40 megabits. And with vectoring, if you have only one single DSLAM driving that copper bundle in a coordinated manner, you can boost that up to 100 megabits. On the right side, however, you see what happens if you have two operators, both of them independently trying to use vectoring. And what you can see here is that the gains of introducing vectoring are a lot smaller if there's more than one operator trying to do vectoring, simply because both these lamps then disturb each other. And that's exactly the principle of vectoring. You cancel out the, the disturbance that comes in from line crosstalk. So this does not fly. The baseline is, from a really technolo technology perspective, VDSL vectoring brings huge gain really only if there's only one single DSLAM operator here. Which is a bit different in the German market today, where there's usually uh, quite some DSLAM operators in a central office. So, what can we do with VDL vectoring? If we look at the targets of the German government, um, at least 50 megabits per second for uh, probably everyone, looks quite good. We can do this on short copper access lines. So if you look here, 50 megabits with vectoring, that should go up to, well, say, 800 meters local loop length, about roundabout. So in dense city areas, this would work. So if, if the German government wants to fulfill the target, then yes, vectoring might deliver it. On the other hand, and we're coming back now to the remote farm out there where the farmer wants, to have, wants also Netflix access, whatever. Um, if we look here on the, on the long lines, on the long lines we don't have huge gains with vectoring. So what's often cited in the press and regrettably also in tech press, vectoring is being introduced to bring high speed access to the remote farm. No, this does not fly for the remote farm, this has almost zero benefits. The, the regularity consequences of the whole thing, I mean, vectoring is technically viable to fulfill the targets of the government, at least partially. Um, the direct access to the copper access line, which we have to die, the unmantled local loop access, um, can only provide it in future for one single operator. So not, for, not anymore for multiple operators in parallel operating their own equipment. There will be public rules and general rules on which operator this would be in a certain area and on a certain cable bundle. Uh, the problem is obviously for all the other operators who have equipment installed today and who cannot use that equipment any longer, if there's only one in the future, um, there should be some compensation here. Uh, and also for the one single operator who in a certain area will provide this single one rules it all access, 
he will fall under regulation and he has to offer a general standard offer to everybody else on the market to similar conditions, basically. The whole idea is a bitstream access never can, can bring the same value as direct access to the unbundled copper local loop. However, to, re to make the reduction of competition as, as little as possible, the bitstream access should be as close as possible as direct unbundled copper access to, is today. So this is the goal of the whole regulation and we'll have to look a bit now into is that goal hit or is it not hit. Another thing which uh, goes through the press quite often and only was recently again on a news ticker so, well, all, all the operators have to decommission their ADSL and SDSL uh, uh, DSLAM equipment. No. The whole vectoring regulation from the German regulator clearly, uh, clearly only rules frequencies above 2.2 megahertz on the copper line. Which means inherently not under this regulation are fre frequencies up to 2.2 megahertz. Which means ADSL and SDSL are, don't use these, uh, these higher frequency bands. So actually, if an operator wants, he can keep his existing gear and he can continue to do ADSL and SDSL with his own equipment. Technically. Whether that is commercially an interesting option to provide up to 25 megabits ADSL2 access in an area where otherwise vectoring with 50 and 100 megabits is available is a difficult question, but I mean, that's a market question and not a technical question. I just wanted to mention this, so no, you can continue to rent unbundled local loop access from Deutsche Telekom, but only for frequencies up to 2.2 megahertz. Now coming to the specific details here, what is offered today in the German market? As already mentioned, there was the NGA forum, I think in 2011 or so, um, which was triggered by the German regulator, but a lot of market actors have come to together and have defined how they would want uh, Bitstream access to look like. Um, the state of the whole thing is, it's a recommendation of a consulting gremium, not more, not less. It's not legally binding, and obviously um, anything that's differing from that can always be done you know, on a one-to-one -one basis. Finally, it's always two carriers have to agree on what they want to do. So this is the specification from 2011. Um, the Deutsche Telekom now made an own proposal on a standard offer. In quite some parts, it does differ from the general offer from the AJA forum, Interestingly, interestingly, while Deutsche Telekom was part of the, Deutsche, uh, the NGA forum. Um, the regulator has asked Deutsche Telekom to refine this offering a couple of times. Then some courts have asked to refine it. Then the EU Commission has uh, forced to refine it. So this went quite some rounds until it uh, came to the state where it is now. Since November the 1st, um, <laughs> Per, per, per statement from the German regulator, this is now in force. At least f until the next round of legal complications comes in. There is no warranty for any money on the market that this status as of now will continue to exist. If EU Commission kicks in again, it might change again. Whatever it is, I mean, this is the status as of today. All the documents should in principle be available on the website of the German regulator. Um, I'm saying in principle, I found it hugely difficult to locate the respective documents because they're not really well sorted. How does the wholesale offering of Deutsche Telekom look like? If we look at the network structure, and this is also public information, then finally we have out there about 300,000 KVZ Knotenverzweige or street cabinets. These terminate today into about 8,000 Hauptverteiler central offices. Um, what then comes as the next layer of recognition is 900 layer 2 bitstream access BNG locations or the so-called CO900. And what you can get already today is L2TP from Deutsche Telekom as a wholesale product where you need to take the traffic in 73 IP BSA locations. So from 300,000 you have different levels of aggregation. The, the, the utmost level to 73, what we are talking about here now is the CO900. If you look into the differences of the, uh, of, uh, of the various options, I mean, looking at the time, I would love to skip this table a bit. Um, mainly, 
the things we need to have to look at at the moment is on a, on a copper access line, you can practically run any protocol you want. Uh, in the offering of the NGA forum, you can also more or less do anything. In the offering of Deutsche Telekom, you're limited to PPPoE and DHCP. And also there is a VLAN tag at a handover interface, I'll, I'll give you a drawing uh, later on, which doesn't apply at all for unbundled copper, which has to be negotiated between the operators in the NGA proposal, and which is dynamic in the Deutsche Telekom proposal. Other properties of the Deutsche Telekom offer, I mean, um, there is some investment protections for other operators who had bought own DSLAM gear, so that's compensated in a standardized way. Um, one thing here is the access onto the copper local line and the aggregation are only available as a bundle and not separately. You cannot take over the, the traffic at one of these 8,000 central office locations where you would probably already have equipment today. That's impossible. You can either go to all 300,000 street cabinets or to the CO900. Um, the price of, uh, of, the, um, uh, of the bitstream line is uh, depending on the bandwidth that is provided, which is independent if you have unbundled copper. And there is de facto a volume-dependent pricing for this wholesale offering, um, which might contradict a bit with the flat rates that end customers expect in the market. And the last thing, yes, you don't have direct access on the DSLAM to do troubleshooting and to see where something fails, if it fails. If you want to take um, layer 2 wholesale access from Deutsche Telekom, what do you do? How does this look like? Um, the subscriber traf traffic at the U interface, that's basically your wall socket for your DSL route at home. Um, you can either have untagged traffic or single VLAN tag traffic. On the other end of the thing, where it comes out of Deutsche Telekom's network, is the so-called A10 NSP interface, that's the handover interface. I couldn't figure what that abbreviation means. I really tried, but I couldn't figure it. It comes from the broken forum. No idea what it means in long text. Um, on that A10 NSP interface, which is one physical interface, you get the traffic with one additional VLAN, one VLAN per subscriber line. So you can, uh, it's an end-to-one -one bundling, and actually it's all quite easy because each VLAN tag goes to a separate subscriber. The, S, uh, the outer VLAN tag is also identical for all customer tags. Clear? That's it. Um, the question is, how do you get that, VLAN, that S VLAN tag, the number of the VLAN tag? Answer, it's assigned dynamically, and it can and will change with each DSL line resync. So there is no database where you could say, this customer gets VLAN tag 1, 2, 3, and this customer gets 4, 5, 6. But each time the DSL line resyncs, you get a different VLAN tag. So how do you then know which customer it is? Quite easy. If the customer sends PPP or EOE or DHCP, then in the options or in the relay agents, you get the line ID. So you can take this out on your BNG and then you can identify the customer again. So what does a, does a wholesale taker need to do? He, he needs to be able to accept the dynamical VLAN tag without any pre-configuration. And he needs to look at the relay, relay agent fields in order to identify his customers. The next thing is he needs to do rate limiting, because there's at the, at the moment two products here. There's VDSL 50 and VDSL 100 megabits. Technically, Deutsche Telekom always syncs the DSL line with the maximum capacity that's there. But if it syncs with 100 megabit and you only ordered 50, then you have to enforce it down to 50. Otherwise, you pay a 10,000 euro fine. <laughs> So you, you need to do some rate limiting to what you've actually ordered or to the actual line speed that's reported to do you in the, in the relay tag if the delivered line speed is slower than the ordered line speed. So you need some, a bit of logic here. How do you do private subscriber access here? Well, that's easy because private subscribers are actually always layer 3 IP services, be it high-speed internet or voice over IP. You can do both based on PPPoE or with uh, IP over Ethernet and DHCP. You can do this. You identify your customer with the relay tags. It's all cool. Or you can also use the PPPoE username if you want. That's a question of whether you want the user to be uh, mobile. Can he roam with his identity or not? How do you do the same thing for voice over IP? Well, if you use the same VLAN as you use for high-speed internet, then you don't have to do anything because the same routing instance. And if it's a different VLAN, also no problem. If you do PPPoE or DHCP again, you get the tags, all cool. One thing to note, there is no multicast replication in the wholesale offering. So if you have linear TV based on multicast, you have to replicate the multicast before you hand it over to Deutsche Telekom. This is also a bit different from the NGA forum specification where it would be replicated in the DSLAM. 
It means if five people are watching the same TV program, you have to transport the traffic five times. On the other hand, linear TV, I mean, most of you will know Netflix and Amazon Prime, whatever, so linear TV might not be the most relevant topic anymore. If you want to do business services on layer three, what do you do? Well, if you also use PPP or DHCP, you have no problem at all. You do the same thing as what you would do for a private subscriber. But if you want to use static IP, so no DHCP, uh, or direct IPOE without DHCP here, what do you do? The problem is you get the traffic, yes. You get the handover interface, they send you the traffic with some VLAN tag, but you can't identify your customer anymore because you can identify the customer only with the relay tag, which means you need DHCP to have a relay tag at all. So this does not fly. If you ne neither use PPPOE nor DHCP for a business customer access, you cannot use this product because you can never figure the relation between the random VLAN tag and the actual customer ID. So, next thing, if you want to do business customer access on layer two, what do you do then? Not all business customer access is based on layer three. I mean, you could have a simple interconnection between two sites of a, of a customer within a city, and you can't force him to use IP, actually. He can also transport whatever traffic over Ethernet. Um, there is significant demand for layer two transport services based on Ethernet on the market. Um, yeah, the question, how can we do that? In principle, you could have a VDSL line on the front end, VDSL line on the back end. If you knew the VLAN tags in advance, put a pseudo-wire in between, all fine. You don't know the VLAN tags. They can change each time. So with, with, the, with the wholesale offering from Deutsche Telekom at this spec, you can can't directly produce this because you don't have a warranty that you will ever have a PPPoE or DHCP relay tag in the whole traffic. You get the traffic, but you can't identify the customer. How can you get around this? Um, what you could do, you could actually run PPPoE and not IPCP on top of it, but something like BCP, so Bridge Control Protocol. You would again have relay tags and all this stuff, um, but I wouldn't know that there is any BNG which could terminate this. I mean, it's, it's defined in terms of protocols, but we don't do it. I don't know whether the competitors do it, and I also don't know whether there's end devices out there which could do that. So how do you want to terminate this? The other option is layer three service. You could tunnel the whole thing. So you take the layer two traffic on customer, put it into GRE or VXLAN or the tunnel protocol of your choice. Then you have an outer encapsulated uh, connection, which then can again use PPPO or DHCP, all fine. You get your line ID, you can manage the customer. But, of course, your MTU gets smaller, you have more overhead in here. What do you do if you need to fragment and reassemble packets and so on? So this is a bit difficult here. What we can also do, and I th we think this is a pretty, uh, pretty nice trick out of this, you can have multiple VLANs to your subscriber. You can do one VLAN with a either dummy or management session which uses PPPoE or DHCP, so you get the relay tag back. And you can have a second parallel service, which then transports your basic Ethernet traffic. The rule is that the outer tag, the S VLAN, is the same for both. The C VLANs you know yourself, and it's actually sufficient if one of both services returns the line ID to you. So what you actually do is you build a second session to get the relay tag, and your primary session for the payload then doesn't need to deliver a relay tag anymore. Now for the part of city operators, if you have own city networks and you might want to roll out vectoring in some areas and in future everybody else has to purchase from you, how would that work? Um, what does the regulator say to this? Basically the same as he says to Deutsche Telekom, you need to provide standard offering for everybody and you have to supply to everybody to the same conditions. Um, Solutions according to the NGA forum or according to the telecom spec should be possible in any case because these are already out and you might also be it might also be possible to make special offers, but you have to have them signed off by the regulator. How do you technically do this? Um, there's two options here. You can either configure this totally static in your network or you can make a, a, a build a dynamic system uh, which is dependent on the actual DSL line state. The static model is quite easy. The static model works right like a layer two access for a business subscriber works today. 
you actually do a one-to-one -one cross connect in the, in the DSLAM, which means each line coming in gets a different VLAN tag on the other end of the, of, of the DSLAM. So you have the tag, you build a pseudo wire through your network, and at the other end you assign the S VLAN tag identifying the customer. So as this is used for business customers today, this shouldn't bring too much changes into a provider's a network. It's easy. Um, if you agree the S VLAN tag with your customers, you don't even need to bother about line IDs and uh, relay, ag uh, relay agents and whatever insertion because, I mean, we're doing the whole stuff with relay agents only to get the S VLAN tag. If it's known in advance, it's a lot easier. So, um, and your own, your own private customer service can completely run in parallel, no problem. How do you do that? I mean, Likely, if you're a city operator, you have systems, processes, automation, and all that stuff already in place for your layer two business customer products. Um, when an order gets in for a wholesale line, you just provision it once. You have no dynamics in the network. It's all easy. It's easy troubleshooting. And you, when you log into a router, you see the config. What's configured there is valid, and there is nothing that pops up dynamically, whatever. So that makes it easy. The other things is, well, your own customers, you might realize them with, all, with different approaches. Um, probably if a customer changes away from you to another operator or back from another operator to you, you need to change your configuration of the DSLAM, so you need to touch the DSLAM. And, well, <laughs> you have a quite high number of network elements you have to touch for each wholesale line. Given that wholesale access lines tend to have to be cheap, you don't want to have to touch main network elements if you, if you want to sell them off. Um, the other thing is, if you also want to make that nice trick with a dynamic S VLAN tag, and I don't know many reasons why anybody could want this, it's not possible with a static model. Because static means static and it's foreseeable, it's not, it's not random dynamic. How could you build a dynamic model? The idea is you automate things as, as far as possible because you only have a small commercial margin on a wholesale line. So you want, want the least possible human intervention here. You do a generic base configuration for all possible network elements out there and you don't touch it anymore if an order comes in. So no per, card or, uh, per customer provisioning. Um, your, own ex your own customers, you provision them exactly the same way as wholesale customers because you don't want to touch your network elements. So the access always looks e identical, even for your own customers. Afterwards, you only have database entries where you decide this is a wholesale customer, this is my own customer, and if it's a wholesale customer, to whom do I have to hand him over? Uh, the actual p transport path in the network it would then not be persistent, but it would exist only while the DSL line is actually in sync out there. So when the modem synchronizes, some nice magic builds the path through your network, and once the DSL line loses sync and the customer switches off his modem, all the configs are automatically removed again. So you, have no, you can never have any remainders of old configs in your network because it's all done automatically. How do you do that? A DSLAM speaks a protocol named ANCP, the Access Node Control Protocol, where it sends the port status to a peer. It says exactly port 111 up, uh, sync rate, blah, 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 port 111 down, and also line IDs and blah, blah, blah. So you need to terminate it somewhere. There's two options again. You can either terminate it directly on your BNG if your BNG supports this. Meaning, I, a BNG speaks ANCP. Um, you get your parameters for the subscriber setup from Radius, so also own subscriber or hand it off to somebody else. You don't need any external systems, obviously, but you're a bit dependent on what your BNG can do or cannot do and on how quick your vendor is to implement anything you need but he can't do today. The option two is you use an external system or OSS. So you basically run an ANCP daemon on a Standard, standalone router, standalone system listening to that. You can have any database of your choice where you have your subscriber parameters. And then you have some, well, template based automatic configuration you're pushing into your network at the moment the DSL line syncs. And which also removes it after all. Um, I, I'm tempted to say to throw in another buzzword this is an SDN like approach. So you have a big database and you do automated provisioning when something happens, you trigger it, blah, blah, blah. Good, so how does that look like? Last thing, dynamic model. You have the DSLAM speaking ANCP to your OSS. You have the big database with the customer data. And what you then do, if, if a port comes up, you trigger the automatic building of these pseudo wires, either to your own service creation platform or to the handover interface. And again, you assign an SVLAN per customer. 
How do we have to look at that here? Well, the network elements only have to provision once for all. Only database entries are things you need to do if you get a new order coming in. And if you have really a mass market business, if you expect lots of wholesale DSL customers, then this might be the suitable model because it's the least amount of work for you per order. On the other hand, your systems processes automation probably needs to be developed fresh from scratch. You have a high dynamic in your network. Um, the status of a network element on a service uh, configuration can change any time and what you see in CLI might only be half of the truth because the rest has been shot in from the site dynamically. Um, which might lead to probably comparably complex troubleshooting procedure. There's lots of dependencies in an end-to-end -end, uh, line and lots of gears need to turn into each other. On the other hand, if you really want to play the same thing here and want to assign dynamic VLAN text, not predictive VLAN text to your customers, then this is the way to go because this is the only way you can do this. Actually, that's it. I would be open for questions if time permits. If time does not permit, we have put a demo on our booth. I've brought a complete small city carrier with me, including DSLAM aggregation, BNG, and then some CPEs. So if you want to have a look at it, be invited. Is there any questions? <laughs> um, there's one, one thing. Uh, I think the adaption rate of um, fiber access amongst those who have the possibility for fiber access is mainly um, this low because it's just uh, prohibi prohibitively expensive. Um, I think Freddy is here somehow. Um, could could you say something about uh, the adoption rate of Fiber 7? Do you have new numbers? Uh, yes, I can. Thanks for asking. Uh, Freddy Künstler, Unit 7. Um, uh, we have, in some areas of Zurich, we're close to 2% take rate now. Our city of Winterthur is about 1.7% as of now. And uh, yeah, that's it. That this is what I can share. So actually, we, we're coming up with uh, with new marketing strategy in January, new new uh, logo, and new everything, and new cool. And uh, we hope to boost that uh, beyond the the nerd the nerd clientele. But 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 basically, the seven percent take rate we have in Germany here is actually a, a fifteen percent take rate is actually a lot more than you have then. No, we are just one of the operators. Oh, okay. uh, I mean, if we look uh, in EWZ in Zurich, the, the utility operator in Zurich, um, <clears throat> they claim, well, they don't claim anything, but, uh, or uh, actually, actually, they, they're beyond, uh, be, below, below business, business plan. No, no, no. Uh, uh, let me explain. Okay. So if you look at the city of St. Gallen, they say what they have. They are probably around 4,000 customers as of now, FTTH customers as of now. Uh, they built some over 30,000 households as of now. But this is only the utility. If we look at the, uh, the, the, the incumbent, our favorite enemy, uh, they, are, they, they are way beyond the figures of the utility. So uh, I think Zurich has probably some areas which are which have 15% take rate of the utility and supposedly plus 50% of the of the potential taken by 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 the by by Swisscom mm -hmm. but there are still areas in in Zurich where there is no fiber yet mm -hmm. and and almost every city has still um uh, white spots in the landscape uh, except, I think of Lucerne, Lucerne, the city of Lucerne in the uh, central Switzerland. Uh, most cities are not yet built fully. Mm. So, okay, but from your experience in those areas which are built out, the take rate is higher than, than the 15% we see in the overall German market. Yeah, because uh, um, Swisscom is now uh, well, they aim to to shut down the the PSTN by the end of the year. Uh, well, by the year end of the year 17, uh, they will greatly fail, in my opinion, but that's another story. And therefore, they are forcing people, uh, they're, they're forcing their, their laggards and their, their end customers to, to migrate their, their systems. And they uh, try also to increase the ARPU, but that's another story. Okay. 
Thanks, Freddy. Any other questions? Sure. Hi, my name is uh, Thomas Kühling from EW Etel in Oldenburg, and we are also facing this uh, situation with Layer 2 BSA and uh, have also. F funny to hear that, I have expected that. <laughs> yes, uh, we have our difficulties with that. Um, one question about the provisioning part you told, uh, it, was, it was a little bit too fast for me. You told that you could do um, some generic configuration with ANCP uh, feature. And the DSLAM, can you explain this, please, again for me? The, the, the key thing is that you run your DSLAM in a one-to-one -one cross connect model, not in an end-to-one -one bridging model, so that you really get a different VLAN tag out of your DSLAM per subscriber line. That's the key thing. And then you use ANCP as a standardized protocol where a DSLAM can tell somebody in the outside world that a line has synced, if it has synced with weight or whatever. You catch that either with your BNG or with an external system, and you then use this to automatically provision your network to, to run a pseudovirus somewhere. Okay, so you, you have still some uh, per customer configurations on the ports itself, for example, the no. line ID or an. Um, yeah, uh, you you do one generic standard configuration for every DSLAM okay. you set up somewhere. Um, the only thing that really changes is the line ID, but all the rest, uh, you can have a standard config where you say cross connect port one, VLAN tag one, port two, VLAN tag two, whatever, and you roll out this configuration to really every DSLAM you build. Okay. Just the line IDs are inserted once and for good, and if a customer moves over from uh, A Straße to B Straße, then he gets a new line ID because the copper going to that building has a different line ID. Okay, sounds interesting. Maybe we can uh, take that topic in the uh, demo you have here. Drop by. I'm happy to invite you. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much.